Good morning, I'm Joe Fryer. Savannah Sellers is off on this Memorial Day. Right now on Morning News Now, President's promise. This morning, a renewed call for change as a community grieves. President Biden vowing to turn pain into action after visiting the scene of last week's deadly mass shooting at a Texas elementary school. This as the Justice Department opens an investigation into how police responded that day. See, every second counts. It's not minute, it's not an hour, it's seconds. See, and they, they never did anything. Plus, lawmakers sound off on a new push for gun control in America. We have team coverage this morning. Counteroffensive, Ukraine marking a new phase of the war against Russia. We'll bring you the latest on the battle over Kherson, plus the message from Ukraine's president to soldiers on the front lines in his first visit outside of Kyiv since Russia's invasion. Travel trouble, many Americans struggling to get home after the long holiday weekend. We'll tell you what's behind thousands of delays and cancellations at airports nationwide and why experts say this could just be a preview of what's ahead as the summer travel season gets underway. And flying high, the new Top Gun movie soaring to new heights in Hollywood and beyond. It's now the biggest opening weekend of Tom Cruise's 40 year career. Now the return of Maverick is bringing some much needed magic back to the movie industry. Good day. So on this holiday, we begin this morning with the latest from Uvalde, Texas, on a holiday filled with confusion, frustration, and mourning. Local law enforcement is now the subject of a federal investigation, a look into how police responded to the shooting at Robb Elementary, which left 19 children and two teachers dead. The Justice Department will launch what's called a critical incident review into how law enforcement handled the mass shooting. Uvalde's mayor requested the review after the Texas Department of Public Safety admitted that officers responding to the shooting made a series of mistakes. It all comes after President Biden and the First Lady visited the town yesterday, meeting with the families of the victims who lost their lives in one of the deadliest school shootings in American history. NBC News correspondent Liz McLaughlin is on the ground in Uvalde this morning, and NBC News reporter Julia Jester is covering President Biden's movements from Wilmington, Delaware. Thank you to both of them for being with us. Liz, let's start with you. What can you tell us about this critical incident review that the Justice Department is now going to lead? Well, Joe, these types of reviews are incredibly rare after a mass shooting only happened about a handful of times. And this is a substantial development as pressure mounts around this law enforcement reaction. Now, uh, this is not potentially punitive federal action. This will be uh, a report at the end of the review from the department's Office of Community Oriented Policing with lessons learned and hopes of improving best practices in future active shooter situations. The decision, uh, or the announcement rather, about this review came yesterday as Biden was meeting with victims' families, including the family of Eliana Torres, a 10 year old born in 2012, the year of the Sandy Hook massacre. She was a bright young girl, lots of talents, loved dancing and softball. She wanted to be both a nurse and a lawyer when she grew up. Unfortunately, those dreams will never happen. Here's what her family had to say about this tragic loss. It's devastating. You, you don't, ex you don't, when you see things like this on TV and some of the places, I mean, it hurts. You know what I mean? It, it, it's sad because you don't, you don't feel that pain until it happens to you. It was like a part of me just fell off. I only, it feels like I only have one piece of my heart now. And that was her cousin there, such a heartbreaking sentiment. Funerals for the 21 victims are set to begin tomorrow. Ileana Torres's family will have a funeral for her on Thursday. Joe? A reminder, this impacts all generations. Julia, this was the president's second visit to a mass shooting site in less than two weeks. What can you tell us about his visit to Uvalde? 
Good morning, Joe. President Biden had a pretty private visit to Uvalde. He spent most of the afternoon visiting with the victims' families and the survivors of the shooting. He was greeted by lawmakers and officials in Texas, and one of those, State Senator Roland Gutierrez, told MSNBC last night that the president assured him that he would be there for the community and offer any and all resources that they need. And as for how the community responded to President Biden's visit. He attended mass yesterday at Sacred Heart Catholic Church, and as he was leaving, he approached a group of demonstrators who said, do something to the president, and he mouthed to them, we will. So from what he signaled to those demonstrators, and I'm sure what were some difficult conversations with those directly impacted by the shooting, as well as meeting with first responders and learning a bit more about the response to this shooting. President Biden has not commented publicly on, you know, what he gathered from his visit yesterday, but it was deeply personal, as, you know, you said he's no stranger to tragedy being the nation's consoler-in-chief. Joe? So, Liz, after the president's visit, how are those families of the victims holding up and any reaction to the news that the federal government's now getting involved in reviewing what happened during the shooting? Joe, a bit of mixed reaction, but this is especially tough week for this community. I've been talking with mental health care workers here, uh, Red Cross Disaster Relief, spiritual care volunteers who say now that these funerals are starting, the reality is setting in, emotions running high, anger, uh, demands for change. Uh, some families are hopeful about this federal probe, that it will lead to more action, more substantial change, but many are saying it's just not enough demanding uh, gun reform, uh, something different than what we have right now, which is mass shooting after mass shooting. I spoke with teachers who were here at this town square memorial yesterday from another uh, community, a small predominantly Hispanic community here in Texas, and it really hit home for them. These last names a little too familiar, those kids' faces looking like kids they taught, and they held up signs as Biden's motorcade passed that said teachers shouldn't be human shields, demanding gun reform reform now. And that's a message that we're hearing a lot in this community right now. Uh, something has to change. Joe. Liz McLaughlin and Julia Jester, thank you both. The Texas school shooting was front of mind on this week's Meet the Press. Texas State Senator Roland Gutierrez spoke about the police response, while Pat McCrory, the former governor of North Carolina, talked about the power of the gun lobbies in Republican politics. Here's a look at the highlights with MTP moderator Chuck Todd. Well, good morning on this week's Meet the Press. We were single issue. We focus on the mass shootings and the political impasse over gun laws. Will any member of Congress ever be voted out of office for being too pro-gun? I spoke with New Jersey Senator Cory Booker, former North Carolina Governor Pat McCrory, former Baltimore Mayor Stephanie Rollins-Blake, plus the Texas State Senator who represents Uvalde, Roland Gutierrez. Here are some of the most important answers from Meet the Press, Compressed. You think there should be, someone should be held criminally account for the, uh, Poor response? Listen, I, I think certainly for me in Texas going forward, I don't know that there should be criminal negligence or anything like that or criminal accountability. But we have to make sure that this never happens again because you and I both know there's probably going to be one of these instances happen again in this state and others. We have to learn from this for sure. There must be many things done, but we know background checks make a difference. We know gun licensing supported by the majority of Americans make a difference. Heck, when Connecticut did it, their gun violence rate fell 40 percent. When Missouri got rid of it, mm -hmm. their gun violence rate raised 20 percent. So we know what works. But I am sorry. We are at a point in this nation where we are going to have to mobilize a greater movement, just expressing regret or sorrow it, until the redemptive power of the love for all of our children is greater than the destructive power of the love of our guns and money and power. Until that redemptive love of our children turns into action, then nothing is going to change. And, and, I'm, and so many generations before us knew this, as Frederick Douglass says, mm -hmm. power concedes nothing without a demand. If there's no struggle, there is no progress. We have got to begin to hold our congressional leaders more accountable for change. I lost a primary two weeks ago to a, uh, a congressman who had a gun in his front trousers. 
in a commercial. In every TV ad. In every sure. TV ad. And uh, that was a more powerful message to the constituency voting in that primary. He was tougher, I was weaker, and yet my record of accomplishment in fighting crime is unsurpassed. But it's about the gun, it's not about the it's, record. It's a it? symbolism, it's a symbolism. And right now we've got, um, we've got people who don't trust right now the criminal justice system. We're letting criminals go. You see the DAs in LA, the DAs in some of these cities where they're letting criminals go after crime, after crime, after crime. And people are going, you know, I'm going to take this into my own hands. I'm going to protect my family. I'm going to protect my home. I'm so going to protect a myself problem. in a car. So what you're saying is Absolutely. The violence is a cultural problem that this country must face. And it's got to be common sense. Our thanks to Chuck Todd for that recap. Now, after the tragedy in Uvalde, there are renewed calls for legislative action to prevent more school shootings. But the laws didn't change after Sandy Hook or Parkland, prompting many to question if this time will really be any different. Are there actually places where agreement can be found? NBC senior Capitol Hill correspondent Garrett Hake takes a closer look. From Newtown, Connecticut, the tragedy at Sandy Hook Elementary, an unthinkable attack on young children. The murder of 26 people in a Newtown, Connecticut school in 2012 horrified the nation and seemed to galvanize it too. Something had to be done about guns. I'm convinced cooperation and common sense will prevail. But 10 years and 51 school shootings later, 94 more people have been shot and killed inside of U.S. schools, including the tragic loss of 19 children and two adults in Uvalde, Texas. Mass shootings are a uniquely American phenomenon, as a recent analysis published in the New York Times shows. For gun safety advocates, the reason is obvious. Americans have easier access to firearms than in any other developed nation and own more of them, with some 390 million thought to be in circulation. But attendees at the annual NRA convention in Houston this weekend don't see it that way. It's mental illness is how I see it. Mm -hmm. It's total mental illness. It didn't occur to me to make a connection between this shooting and a gun. The NRA and its roughly 5 million members form a small but vocal minority, highly motivated, easily mobilized, single-issue voters advocating for a strict interpretation of the Second Amendment. Member Richard Welch thinks gun control advocates have the issue exactly backwards. If they get in trouble, the first thing they're going to do is call 911 and pray that somebody shows up with a gun. Mm -hmm. And so the same thing that they're protesting outside is the same thing that they're going to pray for. The NRA's system of rating candidates and politicians and spending heavily to support the best performers makes the organization a powerful friend to like-minded officials, says Paul Barrett, a journalist and author who writes about guns and politics. Being uh, insufficiently uh, aggressively pro-gun rights um, is, is a potential uh, hazard for any candidate in a red state. Democrats have the most anti-gun ticket in history. They can also be a dangerous enemy. The NRA's Political Action Committee spent $20 million in the 2020 election cycle, mostly on attack ads like this against Democratic politicians in battleground states. John also wants to ban guns that most of us already own. These guys don't get it. Candidates who have the NRA's backing or those who want it learn to speak the same language. But our Second Amendment is not just about hunting. It's about our constitutional right to protect ourselves. The Second Amendment is not about duck hunting. It's about protecting your family and your country. After Newtown, gun safety advocates got organized too. And in 2020, the Every Town for Gun Safety Super PAC actually outspent the NRA, turning the tables on some of its endorsees. Cory Gardner not only stands by Donald Trump, he also stands with the gun lobby. Gardner lost to Democrat John Hickenlooper. As the debate shifts to focus on legislation expanding background checks and creating extreme risk protection or red flag laws, which let judges order guns removed from people deemed dangerous, Polls show both have majority support nationwide, but as history has shown, that may not sway lawmakers, especially from battleground districts or states. The gun issue uh, is the number one motivator for many uh, conservative voters. That simply isn't the case uh, for lots of liberal voters. Our thanks to Garrett Hake for that report. Let's talk about those polls. A new poll from Politico found 88% of Americans support requiring background checks for all gun sales, while 75% support a national gun sale database, and 84% support banning gun sales to those deemed dangerous by a mental health provider.
In other news now, Russia's foreign minister says the, quote, liberation of Ukraine's Donbass is an unconditional priority for Moscow. Those comments come as fighting intensifies across eastern Ukraine. And this morning, the focus is on the key city of Severodonetsk in Luhansk. The region's governor says fighting there is very fierce, with Russian troops now on the outskirts of that city and moving in. NBC News foreign correspondent Molly Hunter joins us now from Bucha with the latest. And Molly, let's start with the latest in Severodonetsk. Uh, what is the latest over there? How is Russia's offensive in the broader Donbass going? Hey, Joe, good morning. Look, as you said, that is the update of this morning, that Russian forces are now in the outskirts of Severodonetsk. Severodonetsk has been uh, the focus of the fighting in the Donbass over the last week. It is the last city in that kind of horseshoe pocket. When you look at a map, it makes sense. It's kind of a cul-de-sac in the Donbass. It is the last city under Ukrainian control. Two big points, though. Ukrainian military there says they are still fighting. They are still in control of that city. There are also a lot of civilians still there. Now, in addition uh, to that update from the the Luhansk regional governor, governor, excuse me, Joe, the Ukrainian military also says this morning that Russian forces are reinforcing their positions on some of the smaller villages uh, in that area. So after they realized they couldn't just take Severodonetsk in one fell swoop, they have started to attack some of those smaller strategic villages to really incrementally encroach on that area, Joe. So Molly, yesterday, we'll talk about another region that's Kharkiv, President Zelensky just as Russian forces started bombing the region again, he visited there following two weeks of relative quiet. This was his first official visit outside of Kyiv since the war started, right? What should we know about that? Yeah, and it's a big deal. It's his first official visit outside the Kyiv area, we should say. He did, of course, visit Bucha, and the city, I should say, looked very, very different when President Zelensky was here. But he visited Kharkiv on Sunday with members of his presidential office, with members of his cabinet. He apparently went to some of the uh, military, not frontline positions, but strategic positions, thanked soldiers there. Um, he did also uh, really say, he gave us a couple numbers that were important, Joe. He said that about a third of the territory in the wider Kharkiv region is still under Russian control. So really trying to kind of buoy, pep talk the troops that were there. He gave out some medals. Um, and just after he left, Joe, uh, Russia stepped up its bombardment. There were reports of explosions and shelling on the outskirts of the city just hours after the president left. And Molly, we're also watching the captured southern city of Kherson. There have been reports that Ukrainian forces have actually launched a counteroffensive there. What can you tell us about that? Yeah, this was a game changer in the last kind of 72 hours. So Kherson is that southern city that really Russia took over very, very quickly. It was the first city they occupied. We spoke a lot about it a couple of months ago. But as the focus has really been, and specifically the Russian artillery focus, has really been in the Donbass region, specifically around Severodonetsk. They're really focusing their forces there. It appears, according to military experts and people like the Institute of the War, of War who are tracking this so closely, uh, that the Ukrainians were able to mount a counteroffensive and really disrupting uh, Russian forces' ability there to kind of dig in and expand uh, their positions on the already occupied areas. Joe? Molly Hunter in Ukraine. Molly, thank you so much. Let's bring in Michael O'Hanlon. He's a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution. Michael, good to have you with us on this Memorial Day. Thank you for joining us. So as we're seeing, Russian forces are making progress in the Donbass, and they're getting closer to capturing the entire Luhansk region. Now, over the weekend, President Zelensky said he didn't believe Ukraine would be able to restore all of its lost territory by military means, although we also know he's previously ruled out giving up territory in exchange for peace. Do you think Ukraine could be forced to do that, to give up some territory, if it does want to end this war. Greetings. Well, that's a good formulation, I think, by President Zelensky. It's very realistic. You know, previously I was worried that with the sense of momentum and the impressive accomplishments that we all applaud for the Ukrainians defending their capital and forcing Russia to more, you know, modestly scale back its its war aims now, that somehow Ukraine would have too much confidence and feel that it could take back the entirety of its territory. I just don't see that happening. Russia just has too much mass, too much artillery, even if it's not so impressive in its maneuver forces or its you know high technology capability. So I think what the president's basically saying is it's going to have to happen through the use of coercion through economic means. In other words, some of the land can be taken back. Then hopefully Russia realizes it's not going to win a, a big new set of battles. So it gets more realistic. Then we start having peace talks that are a little bit more focused on the real issue, which is where will Russia leave? And I don't know if President Zelensky would tolerate Russia holding on to some small areas. I don't know if he would 
consider some kind of joint sovereignty or shared sovereignty or UN administered zones in Crimea or elsewhere. I think his ambitions are still to get back virtually all of the country, but at least he knows he can't do that through sheer force of arms, which I think is correct. Talking more about the battle right now, I mean, over the last few weeks, we've seen a real push, a campaign by Ukraine for more advanced long range weapons to help in its fight for the Donbass. Russia says the supply of such weapons would be a, a provocative escalation. Do you think the U.S. should provide these types of systems, especially if they could be used to strike targets inside Russia? Well, you're right to be concerned. The United States is right to be concerned. But I also think there's a very good chance that Ukraine can be persuaded not to do that. And uh, I think they should be supported in this in this request. You know, it's it's getting to be pretty late to save uh, certain parts of the country. But Russia's tactics of using artillery to just pound and pound away mean that you need some counter artillery systems from places that you can reliably use. And uh, so if you're counting on an artillery tube that's only got a 20 mile range, then you've got to essentially be within a uh, combat radius of a lot of Russian weaponry to fire it. But if you can use an MLRS that has a range of many dozens of miles, then I think your chances are, are much better. Now, you know, again, Ukraine should not get its hopes so high that it believes that just getting 50 or 100 of these longer range systems can somehow allow it to take back all of its territory. But what it can do is perhaps make the current fight, the current cities that are under uh, under targeting, maybe the last ones to fall that same way, or at least give Ukraine a chance. So, yes, I would favor providing those weapons and then keeping a close eye on how they're used. Michael O'Hanlon, thanks so much for joining us this morning. We always appreciate your expertise. Thank you. Let's get a check on your morning news now weather on a lot of folks mind this Memorial Day. Michelle Grossman is with us. Hey, Michelle, good morning. Hey there, Joe. So great to see you. And unfortunately, today we're watching a really big system that's going to bring the chance of some dangerous weather throughout the Dakotas. Also, the state of Minnesota. It's a setup that could bring giant size hail. That's a quote from the Severe Prediction Center. Also, some really gusty winds, winds gusting near 80 miles per hour. We could see some long track tornadoes. So we are expecting a severe weather outbreak. This is a story we're going to be watching all day long. We're already seeing some storms early this morning. We've been watching them really since yesterday evening. Now, on the back side of this system, you see blue. So we're looking at heavy snowfall in the northern Rockies. It's really unusual for this time of year. Lots of lightning, though, on the warm side of this system. As we zoom in a little closer, we do have a severe thunderstorm watch, and that will be the trend as we go throughout the day. We've seen a tornado watch as well. So 11 million at risk. Where you see that dark red, that's a moderate risk. That's four out of five on the scale. We really don't see it that often. And we're worried about the chance for strong long track tornadoes. Baseball size hail. We've already seen six inch size hail. That's about the size of a great fruit. Also damaging winds to 80 miles per hour. And this threat really does stretch into the central plains as well. Now, as we go throughout tomorrow afternoon and evening, 12 million at risk, that threat kind of moves off to the east. It stretches down to the southern plains as well. And part of the problem is we have really cool air on the backside. We have expanding heat in the east. And we're looking at temperatures very summer-like in the east, temperatures in the 80s and 90s, 90 degrees today in Chicago. Check out the east coast. It's warm today. It's going to be summer-like once again tomorrow, 93 in New York City, 96 in uh Philadelphia. We're going to break some records and 90 degrees in Rochester. So as we go throughout the end of the week, we're going to moderate back to average, but we do have some summer like weather in the meantime. And in the meantime, we're going to watch this cold front moving through the east, bringing those that severe weather today. Joe. All right. Lots to keep an eye on, Michelle. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Coming up a long weekend of fun. Now, not so fun for tens of thousands of travelers. I asked them at the service desk why the flight was canceled, and they said, we don't have crew. When we come back, why experts say this could be the beginning of a rough summer travel season. You're watching Morning News Now. Many Americans will spend some of this Memorial Day traveling. Trains, planes, and cars are roaring back to life this holiday weekend. AAA estimates nearly 40 million Americans are out of town. But some airlines are struggling to keep up with the demand. NBC News correspondent Emily Aketa joins us now live from Newark International Airport with the latest. Emily, good morning. Good morning to you, Joe. We all saw the holiday weekend get off to a bit of a rocky start with flight cancellations, especially here in the Northeast. Amid, ba amid bad weather and staffing shortages, it appears passengers are faring a bit better today. But still, experts warn that this summer's travel boom will bring travel woes. 
This morning, frustrated flyers trying to get back home after thousands of flight delays and hundreds of cancellations put a damper on the holiday weekend. I check on the app and it says, sorry, your flight's been canceled. Daryl Berg says he had no choice but to drive to his destination after the last leg of his flight was canceled. Are you worried about your trip home now? Oh, absolutely. As much as like I didn't mind the seven hour drive, uh, I'm not really going to enjoy that again. Bad weather and staffing issues to blame for the chaos, according to experts who warn passengers to buckle up for a bumpy summer ahead. Nothing would keep me from traveling. <laughs> Travel is booming. Nearly 7 million hit the skies this holiday weekend, rivaling pre-pandemic numbers. But airlines are still operating at a lower capacity and have thousands fewer employees than they did in 2019. A stream of companies trimming summer schedules to reduce disruptions, with demand soaring. Just so grateful, you know, to be healthy, to be able to travel and to have a good time. Roads are congested too, with nearly 35 million behind the wheel this holiday weekend, despite record high gas prices, now averaging a jaw dropping $4.61 a gallon nationwide. The prices are too high. Across the board, travel prices are way up, and COVID cases are rising too. For me, it's just very important to just still wear my mask. Still, that's not slowing the surge in travel. So experts say be sure to pack your patients. When you're traveling, you're going to have a lot of company on the roads. When you're at the airport, the lines are going to be long. It doesn't help anybody out if you lose your cool. So just here in New Jersey and New York, nearly 6 million people are expected to travel by plane, train, and automobile. If you are hitting the road today, experts say try to leave early this morning or better yet, tomorrow. Otherwise, you'll likely be among the millions of people all rushing back home to get there in time for work tomorrow. Joe. And I like that advice. It doesn't help anyone if you lose your cool. Emily, thank you so much. Appreciate it. For more, we're joined now by Dan Dicker. He's an independent oil trader and author of the book Shale Boom, Shale Bust. He's also a senior contributor at thestreet.com. Good to have you with us. So many families are heading home after this long weekend. Those gas prices are still high. Emily reported an average of 4.61 a gallon. So how can we save money? Yeah, maybe today, but really for the rest of the summer as we travel. Well, Joe, I'm not going to tell you anything that you probably haven't heard already. I mean, gas prices are high. Uh, all indications are they're going to stay high, and, and uh, at least through the summer driving season, probably for a year or two. There's a lot of catch up that needs to be done by the oil industry, which can't be done immediately after a big, long and difficult time that they've had six years prior to this. So, you know, the, the advice I'm going to give consumers is the same as I would give anybody. Try to avoid um, speed. Slow down on the roads. If you're going to uh, go somewhere, try and go on off hours. As your lead in said, I mean, try to carpool. If you're in the market for another car, maybe it shouldn't be a Ford F-150 or a or a, or a big Suburban, a Chevy Suburban. I mean, these are all the same things that we can do. Um, what's happening right now is that um, the amount of gasoline that's being used on the roads, in other words, the miles driven, is not going down based on prices going up. And that's usually the case. Usually people drive less when prices go up, but that's not happening yet. And until that happens, you're not going to see the prices at the pump go down uh, significantly. So you are right. People better bear up for a long, long slog here. Yeah, and it's not just those prices at the pump. Airline tickets are sky high right now. I mean, what are the best ways to save when you are trying to fly this summer? Again, you know, we have a computer and, and some of these Internet sites, they can give you discounted fares based on uh, if you're able to travel off, off, you know, on an off day. Um, and most people want to go if it's the you know, Memorial Day weekend, they want to leave on a Thursday or a Friday morning and come back, you know, Monday evening. And those are going to be the highest prices for tickets. Uh, the airlines are absolutely having the same problems as people on the roads. There, There's a supply shortage everywhere, a supply shortage of people, supply shortage of jet fuel. And uh, all of this is leading to very, very expensive prices for airline tickets. Same thing applies. You want to, uh, in some ways, go slower. Travel on off days. Uh, make sure that when you go, you go when the uh, demand is not as high as it is during, you know, a, a peak day like today. You, as we know, this is putting a squeeze on millions of American wallets. You mentioned you don't think gas prices are going down anytime soon. I mean, when do we expect to see a return to normal or at least movement back in that direction for all of these costs? 
Yeah, there are two pieces to this puzzle, Joe. It gets a little bit complicated, but the thing that we have to solve first and foremost is the refining industry. It's it's really been overstressed. We haven't had a refinery built in this country in 65 years. And right now with the pandemic coming off and everybody wanting to travel, there's just a lot of stress on refiners to produce more and more gasoline and jet fuel and, and, and you know, refined products like that. So uh, we have to wait for the refiners to catch up. So I would say this season, unfortunately, is going to be very, very bad, but hopefully by the end of the fall and the start of winter, the refiners are going to be able to catch up to this kind of lagging demand that's going on for refined products. And maybe instead of seeing prices at 450, we'll see prices about a dollar lower at about 350. We'll take it. All right, Dan Dicker, thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate it. International headlines now, starting in Jerusalem, where violence erupted during a controversial flag march on Jerusalem Day. NBC's Raf Sanchez joins us from Tel Aviv with more on that and other world headlines. Raf, good morning. Joe, good morning. That's right. Tensions still running high in Jerusalem after yesterday's flag march, which saw thousands of Israeli nationalists parading through the Muslim quarter of the old city. There were scuffles between Israeli marchers and Palestinian residents, and a number of arrests were made. But unlike last year, no rocket fire from Gaza during the event. Colombia's presidential election is heading to a runoff after no one won more than 50 percent in the first round of voting. Left winger Gustavo Petro is the favorite going into the final round. He's pledged to cut Colombia's dependence on oil and to implement a peace deal to end the decades long war between the government and the FARC guerrilla group. And finally, it may be Queen Elizabeth's platinum jubilee, but it's being marked in stone with the monarch's image projected onto the side of Stonehenge. The queen is, of course, marking 70 years on the throne. She is the longest ever reigning British monarch. So, Joe, a very happy start to Jubilee Week to Her Majesty the Queen. Yes, no kidding. It should be a fun week of celebrations. Raph, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Coming up, shifting support, why Democrats are facing an uphill battle in the midterm elections, especially with one group of voters. Plus, bracing for a surge, new COVID cases expected to keep rising after the holiday weekend. We're going to check in with a doctor next on Morning News Now. Now to our NBC News special series, Vote Watch. In 2020, the number of black voters surged, helping Democrats win the presidential election. But a recent shift shows that support is dropping for President Biden and others in the party, and it could have a big impact on the midterms. NBC News Washington correspondent Yamiche Alcindor reports from Pennsylvania. So we got some free giveaways, social status. Jasiri X helped turn out the vote for President Biden in 2020. But now... You have a lot of black people that feel like we sacrificed a lot to make sure this administration came in and we haven't collectively re reaped the benefits. The Pittsburgh activist says Biden has failed to deliver on his promises. There's been a direct attack on our voting rights. That hasn't been addressed, right? We we did all of this uh, organizing around police reform, but like the opposite has happened. It's almost like we're last on the agenda. Right? A year ago, exit polls showed Biden's approval rating among black voters at 87 percent. Now it's 63 percent. But ahead of the midterms, Biden and Democrats will need to convince voters like Farouk Al Sahid to turn out. Al Sahid voted for the first time in 2020. Democrats haven't done anything to improve my my black quality of life in the states. We might just have to sit this one out. Jamie Harrison, chair of the Democratic National Committee, said the Biden administration has taken a number of steps like providing funding for Black-owned businesses and historically Black colleges and universities. What do you say to Black voters who say that President Biden hasn't delivered on a lot of the promises he made on the campaign trail? I like to tell folks, who, you know, Rome wasn't built in a day. We particularly want to do more, but we got to have more votes in the United States Senate in order to do it. Maya Campbell agrees. The Philadelphia resident is eager to have her student loans forgiven. But I think you need, he needs more time to really make real change. I love that he's putting a lot of particularly African-American women in position. And so Still, black really voters like Will Mega say Democrats need to get much more aggressive. What would you say to President Biden if you could speak with him? I would say, Mr. President, we delivered for you 
it's time for you to deliver, to deliver for us. A direct message from the voters that Democrats will have to win back before the midterms. Yami Shalcendor, NBC News. With millions traveling to celebrate the holiday, health experts are worried the weekend gatherings could lead to yet another rise in COVID cases. The U.S. is seeing an estimated 100,000 COVID cases a day, and health experts fear that number could be much higher because many people are testing at home and not reporting their results. Cases right now are six times higher than at this point last year. The CDC says more than half the country is living in an area with a medium to high COVID admission, transmission rate, but many cities are slow to bring back COVID protocols, leaving it up to individuals to decide their own level of protection. Dr. Amos Shadalja joins us now with the latest on COVID. He's a senior scholar at the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security. Doctor, good to have you with us. So what precautions should people take today as they round out their Memorial Day holiday? And how concerned are you that this weekend's going to fuel what's already an alarming rise in cases around the country? People have to think about the fact that when they socially interact, especially in an indoor setting, there's likely going to be some COVID transmission that's going to be present. So if you're somebody that's high risk, if you're somebody that's not vaccinated and you're in an indoor high risk setting, that's where mitigation measures make sense, like masks. If you're doing outdoor activities on Memorial Day, transmission is generally low in outdoor settings. So I think that's something that's less worrisome. But we will see cases increase after this weekend of social interaction. The key thing is, is keeping those cases out of the hospital. And although hospitalizations are up, we're not seeing stress or pressure on hospitals around the country, which is a good thing. And I think we have to sort of come up with a way to be able to sustainably live with this virus using precautions as our individual risk tolerance uh, suggests, as long as hospitals are in good shape. And we tend to think of summer activities as outdoor activities, which are better when it comes to stopping the spread of COVID. Is this weekend, though, a preview of what we can expect to see from COVID for the rest of the summer? Or maybe the fact that so many activities are outdoors, maybe we won't see as much spread. If activities are primarily outdoor, you're not going to see transmission being very efficient for this virus. But remember, in places in the South, for example, during, this, during the summer, it gets very hot and people go indoors into air-conditioned buildings. And we saw in the past a summer surge in the southern states. So we have to, to expect that cases will increase if paces, people are driven inside into air-conditioned type of places to avoid the heat. But the key thing is, is keeping abreast of what's going on in hospitals, making sure we have access to Paxlovid and monoclonal antibodies and home tests and coming up with a way of, of dealing with this like any other respiratory virus. And that's keeping people out of the hospital, keeping our hospitals uh, uh, functioning. You know, this time last year, it seemed like we might be seeing something resembling the end of COVID. Vaccines became more available to the general public, but then Omicron struck. Since then, we've seen a lot more breakthrough cases among the vaccinated weighing all of that, are we in a better place than we were last year or are we in a similar position, do you think? We're in a much better place because we have so much more immunity in the population from vaccines, from prior infections. We have wide ability of Paxlovid. We have new monoclonal antibodies. We have rapid tests in everybody's hand. All of that makes it easier to deal with COVID-19. It's not going to go anywhere. We're going to continue to get more, contag more contagious variants, more breakthrough infections. That's the norm with the virus like this. The key is to shift the disease spectrum to the mild side, to keep hospitals from getting overwhelmed. And in that sense, we have a, we're in a successful situation. We need better vaccines. We need more people vaccinated. But I think we're in an incalculably better place than we were last year. Dr. Amos Shadolja, thanks so much for joining us on this holiday. We appreciate it. A deadly boat collision in southeast Georgia killed five people over the weekend, including a teacher and several members of his family. NBC News correspondent Katie Beck has the details. Hoisted by helicopter to safety. This is one of four survivors in a deadly boat crash in Georgia, where five others lost their lives. We're going to need an additional ambulance. I have two unconscious victims. I know that I'm coming to you, possibly a third in the water. A Memorial Day weekend tragedy unfolding near Savannah, Georgia, Saturday morning, when two center console boats traveling in opposite directions collided on the Wilmington River. Authorities confirming Savannah history teacher Chris Leffler, his wife Lori and their son's 23-year-old Zach and 17-year-old Nate died in the accident, as well as 37-year-old Robert Chauncey. And there's a lot of people that are hurting right now. Chris, known as a passionate, caring teacher and football coach. We just looked at each other, had tears in our eyes.
how does this happen and how do you go on? But officials charged one driver, not on the Leffler's boat, 45 year old Mark Stiegel, with boating under the influence. The Associated Press reporting Leffler's daughter and her friend were among the survivors. The community is going to gather around her because she's, um, she's going to have a big challenge ahead of her. A weekend expected for celebration, ending in devastation, leaving families and communities grappling with grief. Katie Beck, NBC News. Coming up, it's the unofficial start of summer, and for a lot of families, that means more pool days and trips to the beach. We're going to take you to the water for a lesson in swimming safety. Plus, the magic of Maverick. Some of you hit the theaters instead of the pool this weekend, which is why the new Top Gun movie is proving to be Tom Cruise's biggest opening weekend blockbuster yet. Now, this Hollywood throwback is bringing new life to the movie industry. Do your Memorial Day plans include time in the water, at the beach, or maybe in the pool? Well, if you have young kids, now is the time to start thinking about swim safety. NBC News senior national correspondent Kerry Sanders has some advice for us this morning, and he's literally in the pool. Good morning. Today begins swim season, and the experts say if your kids are as young as 10 months, it's time to start learning. It is astonishing. At only 23 months old, Nala face down in the pool on her own. She already knows how to roll over and breathe. When Nala took her first lesson, there was high anxiety for both mom and daughter. Good girl, Nala. She wasn't happy because, you know, she was going under the water. She wasn't Nala, happy. Nala. Now? Now I'm just like, girl, you can do it. You got it. Don't cry. You got it. She knows what she's doing, but she still cries. She's just a baby. But that's the point, teaching infants how to float face up, breathe, make their way to safety. Go get it. Go get it. Remarkably, an infant can learn this in just six weeks. It's a 10 minute private class. 10 minutes. 10 minutes, which some people <laughs> hang up on me when I tell them that on the phone. But because they think it's too short. They think it's too short. But, but you um, discovered? It, it's that short lesson five days in a row is what really enables them to, you know, to, to get the confidence and to retain the skills. At 48 years old, Fleming's cashmere just learned to swim himself. Last weekend, he even made it from the pool to open water. Oh, wow. But his journey is one of personal anguish. A year ago, he turned his back for just a moment. His three-year-old son, Clayton, drowned in the backyard pool. Our hearts and prayers are with you. Thank you. It takes a lot of courage for you to talk about this. Yes, it does. But you feel it's important? It's important. And it's healing also. It's healing. Yes. Because it gets a message out? It gets the message out. Yeah, because it can happen to anyone. And many parents, like 15-month-old Aria's mom. Good job, Aria. Hearing that same message. She's got her face down. She rolls over. But are you still nervous? Well, at the beginning I was, but now I'm okay. Because <laughs> she's learned. Yes, exactly, because she has been learning this, so I know it's a super skill for her. Scotty's been teaching infants for almost two decades. His former student, Luna, was 20 months old when she fell in a pool. They ran out to the pool and she was fully clothed, floating in the deep end by herself. Because she had be, taken a class. Because she had taken the class. And that's that we get that question all the time, like do they forget what they learn? They never forget what they learned. And of course, learning to swim is a skill you'll have for a lifetime. Guys. All right, Carrie, thank you very much for that report. Top Gun Maverick is currently the number one movie in the world, no surprise. And for star Tom Cruise, it's already a career best opening weekend. Now the big question, does this film mark the return of the movie theater? Good morning, aviators. This morning, Top Gun Maverick is flying high above expectations. 
Tom Cruise's eagerly anticipated aviator flick is now projected to rake in more than $151 million over the long Memorial Day weekend. I just want to manage expectations. The film has already shattered a personal best for the man who plays Maverick. The Top Gun sequel gives Cruise his highest earning opening weekend ever, besting $64 million for War of the Worlds and $61 million for Mission Impossible Fallout. What's the matter, Hunt? Afraid of a little lightning? But the top prize for Top Gun will be the coveted Memorial Day weekend box office record, a title that's currently held not in the sky, but at sea. What's that? 2007's Pirates of the Caribbean at World's End earned $153 million during its Memorial Day weekend debut, which means Maverick may be in the danger zone, falling just $2 million shy of the record. This is your captain speaking. Top Gun's supersonic performance comes at a turbulent time for the movie industry as theatrical releases now compete with streaming services, which offer more than just movies. <laughs> Friday's release of the new season of Netflix's Stranger Things has already launched the show to the platform's number one trending spot. There's a lot keeping people at home who are entertainment fans, and that might be the deciding factor on how Top Gun might fall short of breaking the all-time Memorial Day record. Still, even if Cruz's high-flying film misses out on that badge of honor, industry insiders say its soaring box office numbers signal that audiences are still willing to show up post-pandemic. I wasn't looking to come and see anything other than this. Now the focus is on Maverick's ability to maneuver his way to the top spot, because as even novice aviators know... There are no points for second place. It's projected that just about 300,000 movie tickets will separate first from second place. Well we, won't know, well, we won't know if Top Gun is the top dog until tomorrow. The monstrous opening weekend sets the stage for other big titles coming out this summer, like the new Jurassic World film, Disney's Lightyear, and the Elvis biopic. And as we celebrate this Memorial Day, we wanted to take a look at the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier at Arlington National Cemetery in Virginia. President Biden will take part in a wreath-laying ceremony at the historic monument later today. And we wanted to take a moment to say thank you to all the brave men and women who have given their lives for this country. That does it for this hour of morning news now. The news continues right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.